Hello and welcome to the week five edition of the Megapod here on the lines. Matt Brown, Adam Candy, and Stephen Andrus. If you want to follow everybody on the Twitter machine, you can. Adam Candy, two E's, no Y. Stephen Andrus, one, at Matt Brown, M2. Everything we do, absolutely free. Subscribe, rate, review, do whatever you got to do. Hit that button down below and let us know in the comments. If there's any bets you're making that we didn't talk about here, we will certainly be looking in on the comments. Stephen's very, very good about that and uh, responding to some stuff in there. I will apologize for my voice off the top here. We are in that weird time of year in Las Vegas where it's super hot during the day and then it gets pretty cool in the evenings and my body does not respond well to two different types of weather in the same day. So we will try to power through this and we will get this uh, get this podcast knocked out. Guys, we're a forward-looking podcast, but I do at least want to talk a little bit about Thursday night because it does, I think, it has a lot of betting implications, I think, moving forward and certainly kind of a lesson here as we move on and you know we talk a lot about priors and we talk a lot about you know where we power rank teams heading into the season different things like that uh adam you were i think maybe not as high on the colts as maybe me and steven were and certainly i think we were all at least there was no way we saw this coming with the broncos you could have not been high on the broncos and you did not see this coming i guarantee you you did not see this coming with the with Russell Wilson at quarterback and Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy and all this like you did not see a completely inept offense. And so, you know, look, I try to not bail too quickly. But guys, look, I've got a good enough body of work here through five weeks. I know this Colts team is not good. There's something that's not right. Matt Ryan seems to be completely washed. And Frank Reich is calling really, really horrible game plans. I think the same can almost be said for the Broncos in the fact that one, we know the coaching staff has been really, really poor up and up till now. And, and Adam, I think Russell Wilson's losing his fastball. And with all of that, like I am okay. Now getting off of my priors, this Colts team is no longer looked at by me as a good team in the NFL. This Broncos team outside of that defense is no longer looked at for me as a good team in the NFL. I will start grouping them more in that middle to bottom half of the teams. Whenever I'm going into handicapping games. Matt, I understand exactly why. And, you know, you're right. I was not as high on Indianapolis. I didn't see where the pieces all came together for that team. And let's talk about the Broncos more, though, because I think that's the more interesting situation, right? I downgraded the Broncos in my power ratings after week one. And it's not because of Russell Wilson. It's because of Nathaniel Hackett. And we continue to see week in and week out that he's overmatched for the job. And that's not a harsh evaluation. It's not a prisoner of the moment. We've gotten to see in many different ways, whether it's game management, whether it's play calling, he's not elevating Russell Wilson and Russell Wilson is showing that he needs to be elevated in some way. So I have significantly downgraded Denver after this week. I thought the, the defense could carry them prior to the Raiders game. I thought mm-hmm. the defense could you know, win a bunch of games like the San Francisco game. But right now, that team is pretty much a stay away in general, not because of Russell Wilson for me, as much as Hackett introducing so much variance that I don't want a part of them. And, and Stephen, I think this is one of the things, too, that like, you know, look, there, there better not be ego in betting and there better not be ego in your power ratings. There better not be ego in being able to change what you thought. And like, listen, I'm going to lose a lot of futures bets on the Colts. It is what it is. I was wrong, you know, and like I can get off of these priors. I can change my viewpoint. It does not make me a bad better. It does not make me a weaker better or anything like that. I just assumed something was going to go one way. It went another way. I have to pivot. I have to change. I have to make difference, difference making decisions now moving forward. For sure. If you didn't downgrade the Colts after the win against the Chiefs, then that's on you as well, because I think a lot of novice betters out there still at times will look at the box score, will look at the final score and make a determination. Oh, well, the Chiefs beat the or the the Chiefs lost to the Colts. The Colts must be playing better. No, they were extremely lucky and had less than four yards per play and somehow still won that game. And we saw it transpire you must be contagious matt because i'm getting the voice (laughs) in here too uh you saw it transpire on thursday night with the offense continuing to struggle and i think it comes down to a very simple thing this team has spent the fourth most money on the offensive line and they can't protect an old aging quarterback in matt ryan and he has no time to throw the ball um so i 
they've I already downgraded the Colts. The Broncos will be following as well. But in terms of of Russell Wilson, I put equal blame on Wilson as much as I do Hackett. I mean, that final play on Thursday night, he had a wide open receiver on a crossing route that ironically looked very similar to the Super Bowl interception that that Russell Wilson threw. KJ Hamler was wide open for a touchdown. So there are times where Hackett, maybe the, the run pass decision was wrong. They should have just sneaked it for one yard and had four more plays at the end zone. But Russell Wilson needs to know where to go with the ball, too. And I'm, I'm seeing some of that as well. Yeah, it's just going to be interesting. I, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there that, hey, look, this is this is the time of year where you can start to adjust, you know, majorly as to how you view the teams and, and different things like that. And I think you should be at this point. We're at the quarter pole of the season, guys. I mean, like, that's it's I know it's breaks our heart that the NFL season, we wait so long for it and then it goes by so fast. But I mean, we're at the quarter pole of the season. There's no messing around anymore. You got to start deciding who these teams are and you got to really start doing uh, going with that in your handicapping as well let's kick things off here with the new york giants and the green bay packers right now as we sit seven and a half or eight in favor of the packers this game happening overseas so wake up early west coast yet again we don't know if we're going to get daniel jones or not but he was back out there practicing if we don't we're going to get davis webb for the new york giants and adam i don't know what we are looking at from a power rating standpoint with the giants whether it is a banged up Daniel Jones or a healthy Davis Webb because the problem with the Giants has been the offensive line and the thing that's kind of saved the Giants at times has been the mobility of Daniel Jones and you know we know for sure with an ankle injury he's going to be limited at best if not have very limited mobility in general so for me I, it's it would still be a slight downgrade to Davis Webb for sure but Daniel Jones without the mobility isn't really Daniel Jones either. So, you know, Green Bay, I think is going to be a super, super incredibly popular teaser leg. I have them in several teasers this week, getting it under a field goal. Uh, I completely understand that. We're looking at a low total here of about 41. Keep in mind something else that you just mentioned when it comes to the move from Daniel Jones to Davis Webb. That's a one to a three. That's not a one to a two, right? Tyrod Taylor is the two for the New York Giants, and he's in concussion protocol. So, Right now, you're looking at the Giants potentially going to a quarterback who they drafted years ago, thinking he was the answer, cut and then brought back in an emergency basis, essentially, to be in this position. So uh, I understand why Green Bay's popular teaser leg, and I'm the first to tell you that this three and one record for the Giants is a lot more mirage than it is reality. Uh, something still doesn't look right to Green Bay's offense for me. And I think you're looking at an evaluation in this game. That's going to look remarkably similar to how you evaluated last week's game against New England, right? You are already working with a backup quarterback, but you are looking at a team that despite the fact that it can't pass the ball can run the ball with a little bit of effectiveness. Saquon Barkley obviously has been pretty good behind a bad offensive line up until this point. So I would evaluate the game in a very similar fashion than uh, to how I did last week. And ultimately for me, it's not a play uh, playing this game in London and introducing, uh, you know, that variable is enough for me to to stay off it. But I understand why people like Green Bay. Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I think too, Stephen, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the week. And if you haven't watched the video, it's right here on the channel. Uh, I think this is a fine survivor play as well. If you didn't already play the Packers, I would not have a problem with you if you wanted to play them this week either. I just does look like a win. Regardless, I think the defense is good enough to keep the Giants from going crazy on the offensive side of the ball, and the offenses look just good enough to probably squeak out a win here. I don't think I could lay it, though. I don't think I could lay the full eight, and so that's why I looked at this from a teaser leg standpoint. Yeah, I couldn't lay it either because I agree with Adam that there is a concern with Green Bay's rushing defense being bottom mm -hmm. five in rush EPA and success rate against the run, and the Giants aren't consistent running the ball. They are 19th in success rate, but they are explosive because of Saquon, which has led to a top 10 rush EPA offense. But the Daniel Jones going out there and being compromised, his best weapon with no wide receiver core is his legs. We've seen that. And for this number to move back into teaser range with the optimism that Daniel Jones is going to play, this was out of teaser range when they didn't think he was going to play. Now we're back in that range where we can get it through the seven and through the three. And I jumped on that the minute I saw it because I don't care if Daniel Jones is playing. It's clear to me that he's not going to be his normal mobile self. And maybe they get Wandale Robinson back this week, but 
he's a rookie. He's played like two snaps this year. So um, I thought it was really interesting last week that the market told us exactly what we what they think of the Giants when they had a home game against the Bears and it stuck on two and a half all week. They could not get to a full field goal minus 110. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, I don't think we ever got to a, a minus 110. I think there were some threes, but they were yeah. juiced. Uh, but that that told me a lot about what the market thinks of the New York Giants against one of, if not the worst teams in the NFL. So I think teaser looks really good here. Yeah, I think my last thing I would say, and, and Adam, you kind of touched on, and both of you guys actually kind of touched on it. Listen, regardless of how you think the outcome of this game is going to go, Saquon Barkley, and unless there's some sort of injury situation is going to go on, he's going to have a massive role, be it, you know, in my opinion, is probably might end up being the leading receiver for this team, actually, in this game, considering the wide receiver room right now for the Giants. I do eventually expect Tony and Robinson to to kind of take the lead here, but I don't know if that happens this week. So with, especially with them not being able to practice the last couple of weeks and all the stuff that's been going on from an injury. Tony situation tried them, to practice and then was downgraded. Yeah. Tony went from limited to DMP. So I don't think he's back. So if you look here, we're talking Saquon receiving yards is sitting 24 and a half right now at one of the books out there. I would be I like I, that's the bet for me in this game is Saquon catching a bunch of passes here. Um, Adam, you watch obviously more Giants games than anybody else. And I know that they try not to use him a ton in the receiving game, but I just wonder if they're just going to be forced to in this one. I think you're going to see them run the ball very honestly. And I, I don't mind playing the over 24 and a half yards because I think one good screenplay gets you to the bulk of that. And I think the Giants are going to have to do some of that to keep the pass rush off whoever the quarterback is. So I, I don't mind that play. I just ultimately think you're looking at the Giants probably having an average depth of target of about five yards this week. Pittsburgh Steelers at the Buffalo Bills. This is a 14 point spread as we sit right now, fellas. This has hit 14 and a half at some places has come back down. But uh, it looks like maybe we're going to toggle between 14, 14 and a half, shockingly enough, 45 and a half is the total. Steven, very simple for me. I mean, again, from a survivor standpoint, go to town. If you're not playing in Circa where you need to save the bills, go, go ahead, play them. I have no problem with that. It's a layup, especially if you're in a pool that's been decimated and there's only a few people left, just play the chalk at this point. But um, look, it's too tough for me to lay it with the Bills, and it's too tough for me to take the points with the Steelers. Here's the deal. The Bills have a history of beating up on bad opponents. That has me. T it has it very tough for me to take the points with the Steelers with a new quarterback in Kenny Pickett. At the same time, the Bills are coming off of two very, very tough games, and they play the Chiefs next week. So we're talking about a, a game in which they were out on the field a ton the past two weeks. And then they have the Chiefs next week. So it wouldn't surprise me to see them get up 20, 24 points in this game. But then you find the starters on the sideline early in the fourth quarter and it leaves the back door wide open. So it was one of the first games I scratched off just given the the where the schedule falls for the Bills and how those games leading into this one kind of played out. So uh, no, nothing for me in this one. So fun fact, the Steelers have never been a 14-point dog since the 1970 AFL-NFL merger. Absolutely not a reason to make a bet in this game, but just a, a fun historical fact. Um, I think if you're going to bet the Steelers, I am tempted at plus 14 and a half because this is the NFL and that's just such a monster number. Mm -hmm. And if you play it, it's, it's just a bet that Kenny Pickett can move the ball better than Mitch Trubisky did. The Bills' pass rush is strong, but digging into the numbers, I, I found something a little bit interesting, that the Pittsburgh O-line has actually been top five in pass block win rate. For those that don't know, that that is a metric that uses chips and next-gen stats from the NFL to measure how often the offensive linemen are able to hold their blocks for at least two and a half seconds or longer. So they're top five in that metric to the surprise of me because we all thought this offensive line was not going to be very good coming into the season protecting the quarterback. But nevertheless, Mitch Trubisky ranked 30th in EPA, 28th in success rate, 27th in completion percentage over expectation. I think he was just holding the ball too long. I think he didn't know where to go with the ball because the metrics tell us that the O-line was doing enough where he should have been able to distribute the ball. So can Kenny Pickett be just a little bit better than that? Can he? Last week, he was very accurate 
although his only three incompletions were interceptions. Uh, so it's tough. It's a leap of faith is the total plug your nose. I'm, I'm curious what Adam thinks. I'm initially tempted at such a large number if we can get plus 14 and a half. Uh, Adam, the one thing we do know, uh, the Buffalo defense has been very good for the last few seasons. It's good again this year. And even with the injuries, they figured out that they just scheme so well that it hasn't really been that big of a detriment to them that they're kind of battling through injuries either, which is another thing that has me feel a weird. One of the weird things that I saw as well, which just because of the personnel that they had, the Steelers have been running man coverage in de- on defense at the fifth highest rate in the NFL, which is. It's just weird to me considering their defense is not what it has been the last few years. So that was just odd to me. And I think if they run man coverage in this game against Josh Allen with that gigantic arm of his and these receivers that he's got, it could be very, very bad news for the Steelers. So I don't know if they do a big adjustment for this one as well. It's just a, a lot of weird, a lot of weirdness going into this one. There is Matt. And I would add the injuries on the Buffalo side, right? Uh, Isaiah McKenzie, Dawson Knox. Uh, We know that Gabe Davis has been beaten up. Like they don't have a lot of the weapons that they have. I'm not trying to say that that makes the Steelers any better. Uh, For me, the one way I looked at this and I ultimately haven't played it, it's still a lean, but I looked at this game under uh, largely because of these injuries on the Buffalo side. Look at the fact that last week against a Ravens defense that had been, let's just say, vulnerable to the explosive play they struggled to get to 23 points uh, they struggled to get to more than three in the first half so you know i haven't played it yet um mm-hmm. i do think kenny pickett throwing three interceptions last week makes me a little bit nervous about playing an under because you could end up with buffalo with a bunch of short fields and putting up you know 35 yeah. or 40 um but ultimately i don't have a lot else to get involved with in this game yeah it's it would probably be Steelers are pass for me because I do think you're going to see a lot of the Bills starters on the sideline leading into this Chiefs game. I wish we could play how many quarterbacks would play in this game, and I would take the over two and a half because I think that we're going to see backups again for the Bills in this thing. But um, that's about all I've got here. I, I, you know, maybe a contest play if you want to be, go against the grain. Uh, but a lot of people will be scared off from this game. Maybe that's the way to go about it. But that is all. I can do here. Los Angeles Chargers and Cleveland Browns, a game I think is very, very interesting. The way that this has come was sitting three, then went to two and a half, then went to two. There's one and a halves now out there in favor of the Chargers. The Browns, uh, we know, have been a weirdly efficient offense so far with Jacoby Brissett at the helm. 47 and a half is the total. Adam, when we look at this one, the tech, the totals actually trickled up just a little bit here over the last 24 hours. I get it. Because if we know there's one way to pick on this Charger defense, it would be the run, which, by the way, with all the upgrades that they made in the offseason, they're still not great against the run. And I think a lot of people look at this and say, how could you ever bet an over when you have the Cleveland Browns? All they want to do is run the football. But if you run the football highly efficiently, it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, you're still going to score points. And and if you're putting together 10 and 12 yard chunk plays every now and then, then you're gaining a lot of yardage and it's easier to score. So uh, I get it. I also wonder about the spread being so short from a charger standpoint. I think that the mindset and the image of this team is like, oh, they're so injured. They're so hurt. But this team's got a decent amount of depth and certainly from the receiver position can still score points with Eckler out of the backfield and Williams and the tight end situation and all that. So I don't know. It's, it's a curious, curious game for me. Not a teaser leg, though, uh, is teaserable from a Brown standpoint. It is. And I think that the Browns teaser is the only thing that could get me interested in this Mm -hmm. game. However, uh, this is an injury report game through and through Mm -hmm. for me because you got to look at the Cleveland side and say that who is available on defense, especially is Miles Garrett going to be able to go this week? Is Jadavion Clowney going to be able to go this week? Denzel Ward, JOK. You have half the defense and especially the part that matters on the injury report. So Mm -hmm. I'm not getting involved with that part on the other side. You're right. I think there is a perception here with the chargers that they're in bad shape, but I also realized that Justin Herbert could, uh, you know, be in a spot where he's one good, uh, solid hit to the ribs to not being on the field. So I'm not involved at this point. I think I could be involved on a Cleveland tease. If we see that some of these defensive guys are ready to go, but as of now, it's a pass for me. 
Steven, when we take a look at this thing, um, I the only way I think I'd play this would be the total. I think if there was a flat 47, I would still play the over. I look at a Chargers offense that I think is going to be able to move the ball in this game. I mean, here's the deal. We came into the season thinking that maybe the Cleveland defense was going to be a little bit better. It has not been. It's actually been pretty bad. It's been one of the worst defenses in the league so far. I think kind of under the radar. It's been one of the worst in the league so far. And so we can talk about the offense all day long, which is fine. But the defense has been equally as bad as the offense has been good. And this Charger team can still move the ball. They can still put up points. And they still give it up on the ground. I think this has like sneaky shootout potential kind of going on here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Justin Herbert torched this defense last year for 398 yards and four touchdowns, and we've seen that they have not been better early in the season this year, the Browns defense. So uh, the Beat the Closing Line pod that records for us on Tuesdays liked Cleveland at plus three earlier in the week. So uh, again, another reason to listen to our sister pod if to get the best of a number. Uh, that three is gone. It dipped down to two, and then we saw some pushback and some support for the Chargers. Uh, so I think we're settling in here around that two and a half. One of the big themes for me this week, guys, are teams that are stepping up in class after playing an easy schedule to start the year and also mm -hmm. stepping down in class after playing a really tough schedule for, through the first four games. The Browns are the former. I mean, no team has played an easier schedule through the first four weeks with the Panthers, the Jets, the Steelers, and the Falcons. So... All the numbers that we have on them, we have to, I think, properly put in the right context based on the opponent that they've played. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because that was kind of going to be the the, the follow-up question to you here was when we look at this Brown squad, like the offensive efficiency, and I understand they're all numbers that are adjusted by opponent and all that, but like it is very hard not to, to look at the fact that they played by far, not just the easiest schedule through the first four weeks, but by far the easiest schedule through the first four weeks. For sure. I, I can give them a pass for the Jets loss. It was like a, a less than 5% chance that they should have lost that game with an onside kick. Fine. But in the Falcons game, they clearly were missing a lot of key defensive pieces in the front seven, uh, which allowed the Falcons to move the ball with a weak offensive line more so than they would have. So I think to Adam's point with the injury report, if you're going to back Cleveland in this game, you have to wait and make sure that those guys are coming back. There are like four key guys in the front seven. I, at least three of those guys got to get back and play in this game for me to want to, at this point, back mm -hmm. them at less than a field goal. I mean, the only way I consider it at this point is if it's a field goal, but I don't think you're going to get it. So, um, teaser would be the only way. And I, I just think, are we selling too low on Herbert now that we're less than a field mm -hmm. goal, despite all of the rest of the injuries around him? Because I know Keenan Allen had a setback. Rashawn Slater, the left tackle's out for the year. but And we always assume that that's going to be a big drop off. But the backup did really well last week. Jamari Saylor, zero mm -hmm. pressures allowed. He was the top rated PFF player on the Chargers last week. He was phenomenal as the backup left tackle, albeit it's against the Texans. And if Miles Garrett plays, it's a totally different animal. But at, at least first career start, he did awesome. So you're getting Herbert versus Brissett with Herbert against a defense that all signs point to was not very good against the easiest schedule in the NFL through the first four weeks at less than a field goal. I'm on the fence, but man, I, mm -hmm. I think this is a buy low spot maybe here for the chargers. It's, I mean, it's a chargers a pass for me if I'm playing the the side and I know that that's, you know, the unpopular side, everybody wants to play the Browns here, but I, I'm with you. I think that like, I just think the perception of this team has gotten a little too skewed. Yes. There are key injuries, no doubt about it, but outside of the Jags, like Every team is injured. You're right. Like everybody's missing somebody. And so I just think that we've maybe we've swung the pendulum too far at this point on the Chargers. So yeah, if I was playing the side, it would certainly be the Chargers or pass. All right, guys, let's get to another game here that is a pretty big spread. And it's the Bears and the Vikings sitting right now. Vikings seven and a half point home favorites. 44 is your total. Steven, we do power ratings every week. I want to put the Bears last every single week. I don't know if I have like every week, but it's, you know, they're they're going to be a bottom feeder no matter what. They're going to be in the bottom three all season long. They're bad at everything. They don't do anything good. 
The Vikings, although it hasn't been the most efficient offense at times, it's gotten it done when it needs to get done. Kind of a middling of the road here type offense. I don't think it's going to matter for them in this one. Very popular teaser leg. I completely get it. I have the Vikings in teasers as well. They're going to win the game. I don't know if they can win the game by a full touchdown. You also see these teams kind of coast sometimes. Like they get in this weird mentality when they know they're playing just a horrible team and they don't keep their foot on the gas. So a little odd for me with all that, but uh, teaser leg for sure. Love the Vikings in a teaser. For sure. If you're in our discord, you would have seen that a couple of us bet the Vikings minus six and a half on the look ahead because we mm-hmm. we thought that was too short of a number. And now we're back to seven and a half, which is a totally different argument now. Right. Like, yeah, asking Minnesota to win by two scores, no matter who they're playing, has not been something that you've wanted to do. Um, even in, in this year's version with Kevin O'Connell. So I'm sorry, Bears fans. Like, you deserve better. I'm, we're going to trash Justin Fields every week on this show, and uh, it's a shame that you guys have to put up with this. But <laughs> just another week to highlight his ineptitude. We mentioned last week he was bottom five in basically every advanced quarterback metric, CPOE, success rate, etc. The Bears offensive line is actually top 10 in pass block and run block win rate but they are dead last in pressure allowed. So how does that happen? It's because of Justin Fields. He's holding the ball longer than any quarterback in the NFL, 2.92 seconds per snap. So that's how you can get that difference in those two metrics. And in terms of pressures and sacks, I mean, that that's a quarterback stat. And Fields is getting sacked 19% of dropbacks. The worst team in the league last year was only 10%. And the next closest team this year is 11%. So... Yeah, at this point, phenomenal teaser leg, in my opinion, for the Vikings. Adam, we take a look here. Um, I mean, it's a it's a 44 total. And even if the I look at this and I kind of go, all right, let's give the Vikings a really good offensive day. And they put up 27. Man, we get more than we getting enough from the bears to get this thing over 44. Like, I mean, I, st- I like that. Like, that's the thing for me. I like, I look at this, I'm like this is the total that's been sitting there for me all day, all like all week long where I'm like, what am I missing here? Why is this thing not plummeted to like 42? Um, I don't know. Maybe there's, maybe they think that there's going to be garbage time stuff. Maybe there's whatever. I don't know. I just, this seems like a dead under to me. And I'm, I'm wondering if I'm missing something. I understand why you're looking at it that way. The Bears have actually, with the exception of the Green Bay game, been able to do their part in putting up a couple of scores, um, or at least the equivalent of a couple of scores, even if it takes Mm -hmm. field goals, to get to that spot. So uh, I think I'd pass on it because I do think they can run the football a little bit. Stephen talked about the quality of the offensive line. It's been a lot better than we thought it was going to be this year. I want to look at the other side with Minnesota because, once again, Zimmer or no Zimmer, I have no idea what this team is. I I can't get a handle on them. Look at what they've done to this point of the season. They play one good half against Green Bay and coast that home in week one, right? Then they come back and get blown out by the Eagles. Then they need a miracle comeback against the Lions to escape that game. And they nearly blew the game and double doink aside might have blown the game in London against the Saints. So I don't know that we have a great evaluation on Kevin O'Connell quite yet as the head coach of this team. It's obviously better than Zimmer because they're winning games that they would have lost under Zimmer. Uh, But do I see enough potential for weirdness to stay away from this game? Yeah, I do. Uh, If you like the Minnesota teaser leg, I totally understand why, because the Bears have been absolutely inept. But that being said, I can't get involved in this game. Guys, the one thing I do, if you'd want to like look ahead as well, um, the way that the the way that these teams have started to shape up and the way that this season has started to shape up, outside of the Eagles, this Viking schedule is the second easiest left in the NFL. So you might be if you wanted to take a flyer on some Vikings futures in some way, shape, or form, like there are you know, games that we heading into the season, we thought were going to be more difficult. Arizona, Washington, New England, the, the, the lions, even Indianapolis. Those are all left on the schedule here for the Vikings. These are all games that were at least thought of to be, you know, way, way tougher heading into this year than they actually are at this point in the year. Like this is a very easy schedule for this Vikings team. 
there's an outside shot. If the Eagles somehow stumble a little bit, we can be talking about the Vikings going for the number one seed in the, in the NFC. So just something to just something to look at that this schedule started to ease up with how these teams are playing now over the course of the year. And so a super, 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 super favorable way uh, path for this team the rest of the way. So just something to, uh, if you find you have a futures bet that you like on them. Detroit Lions and the New England Patriots. As we sit right now, Patriots are three, three and a half point home favorites. 45 and a half is the total. Adam, we might get Daniel Jones. If we don't, it's going to be Bailey Zappi. It will not be Brian Hoyer, who has been put on IR due to a concussion. Mac Jones. So, Mac Jones. I mean, Mac Jones, yes. Mac Jones or or Bailey Zappi in this thing. Um, what does it matter to to you with the way that you want to go about betting this game or does it matter at all? Like, does, is there any, is there anything that could happen at the quarterbacking position for the Patriots that would make you want to play one way or the other in this thing? No. Uh, the, and mm. it's the same evaluation I had of new England last week. This is a team that wants to run the ball. And this is a team that ran the ball very effectively in mm. green Bay. That, uh, that new England side that we talked about last week was one of the easier covers of the week. And on the other side, again, I talked to you about this, Uh, last Sunday night, uh, the line is actually not really moved in my favor, but I took the Lions in a teaser last Mm. week because of the fact that I think the style of play that New England is going to throw out there is not going to lead to them winning anything by more than one score, even if they do win the game. So I have Detroit plus eight and a half in pocket. Um, I'm sorely tempted to add Detroit plus three and a half, but that being said, it gets into what you discussed, uh, which of their guys is actually ready to go, right? Uh, DeAndre mm-hmm. Swift is still questionable. Amon Ross St. Brown is still questionable. Chark is trending toward playing. Um, that being said, didn't exactly slow down the Detroit offense last week. Uh, they still were able to put up points. So ultimately, I like where I already am with this game. Um What's sl- what stays for me in my mind is the total at 46. I-, I would be leaning toward over here based on the fact that Detroit can still put up points with Jamal Williams as the running back and Jared Goff slinging it around apparently, but I haven't played anything other than that teaser at this point. Yeah. So the thing that's kept me off this total and, and Steven, it's like a, a lot of people you know, blindly playing overs in these Detroit games. And I, I would normally I would get it. I don't I can't say for sure because I can't get in the mind of of Bill Belichick. But for me, it's a team that already plays at the 24th slowest pace situation neutral as it is anyway. And if they have to go with Bailey Zappi, I bet you this thing slows to a crawl, right? Because Belichick's smart enough to know that, hey, look, the only way Detroit wins this game and beats us outright is if we create a higher variance game by allowing for many, many more possessions and, you know, things can go crazy. Let's lower the variance. Let's play ball control. Let's sit here and and try to let the air out of this thing. So again, my just guess as to how that's going to go, but as well as they've run the ball as poor as the defense has been for, for Detroit. That's my only concern with the over is I do think that there's a real legitimate chance that Belichick just plays keep away and, and they, they run the ball, you know, 65% of the time in this game. Matt, do you think this move off the key number three to Patriots minus three and a half is Mac Jones injury related? And if Bailey Zappi actually starts, we're under a field goal, right? Is that where you're kind of thinking here? Yeah, probably most likely, or at least back onto the three. You yeah. Know, at least back onto the three. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, our, mm-hmm. our injury expert, Will Carroll was talking about this, this high ankle sprain that Mac Jones has and, and, um, you know, his sources down at Alabama, which is where Mac Jones was looking at. They've had a lot of experience with dealing with this injury, with going back to when Tua was there. Um, if he plays, it's it's Will's estimation that he's going to be far less effective. Like this is way mm-hmm. too quick for him to come back from a, a high ankle sprain as much as you could tape it up and, and shoot him with some painkiller or whatever. So that, that's the first thing to kind of keep keep aware here. And don't forget that Belichick pulled some Bellatrix last week, had him trot out there and throw some passes next to the rest of the quarterbacks during the open session of the media, and then he didn't play. So uh, I think this this move to three and a half is based on some Mac Jones optimism. I'm not totally convinced he's going to play. If he doesn't play, which is kind of what I'm suspecting, then I would I, I would be interested in the Patriots at 
at less than a field goal, despite the fact that Bailey Zappi's playing. Because going back to my my earlier theme for this week, very big differences in class for these two teams this week. The Patriots are one and three, but those three losses were to the Miami offense, the Baltimore offense, and the Green Bay offense, in which they acquitted themselves quite well. The Detroit offense, despite being number one in the league, very impressive, but three of those were against the Washington, Minnesota, and Seattle secondaries. The only other one was against the Eagles, where most of their production came in garbage time in the fourth quarter, and through the first three quarters, they had less than five yards per play. So very big difference here for the Lions this week on the road against New England. With that being said... When New England has the ball, the Lions are allowing 6.5 yards per play. That's a half yard worse than the worst team last year. Like this, this Lions defense is pitiful. Mm. So the Patriots on offense, despite that tough schedule to start, top five in early down success rate and has just been a bit unlucky on third downs. They're in the middle of the pack this year on third downs. So um, minus three Patriots would be my stopping point. I think it's worth waiting to see if Zappy plays and you get off that three and maybe get a two and a half. Would never back them at minus three and a half because you're just losing a ton of value. But with the differences in schedule, I think it is worth playing New England here to win this game by a field goal. These sports books are very smart because I was looking up what the Ramondre, Ramondre Stevenson and the Damian Harris rushing props were. Hmm. They're not listed. Uh, and uh, yeah. They're not listed. These sports books are getting a little smarter in all of this because I was going to say just play them over now regardless because it doesn't matter if it's Mac Jones or if it's Bailey Zappi. Like, you know, the Mac, uh, limited Mac Jones certainly means more running regardless against the Detroit defense that is 32nd DVOA against the rush, 32nd yards per rush allowed, 32nd yard uh, points per play on defense allowed. So, I mean, it is – it leads to a ton of, of rushing yards. But again, it's not posted yet. They will post it eventually as soon as we figure out who's playing quarterback. So get in before those numbers get out of hand. But that is a, that's a play for me. I would be all over some overs on the rushing yards for both of those running backs. I think that uh, I think they're both going to be able to have a decent day out there in this one. This is a fairly interesting game here, guys. Um, this is... Seattle Seahawks and the New Orleans Saints sitting five and a half. So we're in a dead zone. 46 is the total. Steven, this did hit six very shortly. And then, and then people took the six on Seattle. It's gone back to this dead number of five and a half. It, I get it because the Saints are a step up in competition for Seattle. We've seen Seattle be able to move the ball on bad teams. So that's kind of been the MO for this squad. I know that we made a uh, jumped up a doubt about Geno Smith and don't get me wrong. He has been good, but their success has come against bad teams. They've not had success against good teams. My only problem is I don't know if we know if the saints are good or bad or, or somewhere in between. And so that's why I can't get there. If anything, if this got back to six, it would have to be a play on Seattle for me if I was going there, but I can't, I, I can't get there at that dead number at five and a half. And so it's a, it's a wait and see for me. I think my opinion of the Saints at this point is you know, they're, they're like a bubble team that maybe they'll have a shot based on schedule to get the seven seed. So just very mediocre, very middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. so to your point with Seattle, 71 points combined against the Falcons and the Lions. So like who cares, right? I mean, anybody's yeah. going to score on those two defenses. They played Denver and San Francisco. They had 17 total offensive points. New Orleans defense is good. They're not that good. They're not Denver, San Francisco good. So, and I also don't trust the New Orleans offense to cover a touchdown basically here. We're at five and a half. Mm -hmm. So no play for me in this one, more just to sit back and observe and see if this Seattle offense can keep the momentum up against the much better defense. I'm, I'm very curious about this. Uh, we thought we were going to be fading Seattle for most of this season, and maybe we still will against this top this top half of, of teams in the NFL. But I'm starting to get a little more optimistic here, man. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to think that we had this all wrong about Seattle last year where, you know, Pete Carroll was burying his head in the sand and running more than he should be. And um, Russell Wilson was – our opinion was that he was a product of the system and being put into tough passing situations, and that's why his metrics were low. Well – the evidence is showing to the contrary this year so far. Russell Wilson has looked like the same, if not worse, quarterback he was in Seattle. And Pete Carroll has showed a willingness to open up 
and pass more than we thought he would. So I think Seattle is a very interesting team moving forward that we need to consider changing our prior opinion on. So it does look like we're going to get Andy Dalton again, Adam. It does look like they're going to be without Michael Thomas, both of both of Jameis and Michael Thomas not practicing. So typically that means they're not going to be able to go. I don't know if that really changes your opinion because at me at this point to me, a a Andy Dalton at, at full health comparatively to a Jameis Winston with a broken back. It's kind of a push for me, you know, in, in all of this. And so I kind of just view this team as what we've seen basically the last couple of weeks was just a very bland, mediocre type offense. And yeah, the defense might be better than what Seattle's beat up on so far, but look, they don't blitz. They don't get any real pressure on the quarterback. So Gino's going to have time to try and hit DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett and all that. Like, I don't know for, for me, despite the fact Seattle's defensive woes, I think it would be Seattle or pass for me, but I'd need the, I would need to get to the six here and try to get on at least a semi key number. Nah, this game's an entire pass for me. And if <laughs> you as a saints fan are saying you have no idea who new Orleans is like, you're the one who watches this team closer than most. I don't really have any sense of who they are. I, again, there's another team like Cleveland where I thought a defense could carry them through mediocre quarterback play mm -hmm. for a length of time. And hasn't really happened uh, to this point. Uh, no, to answer your question, my valuation doesn't change based on a banged up Jameis versus a healthy Andy Dalton. I think we get a little bit too quick to move teams numbers based on quarterbacks alone. Um, yes, I get the difference between, you know, say, uh, you know, Daniel Jones and Davis Webb is a point or two, but this isn't really worth a whole lot to me. Uh, so, no, I don't have any interest in this game. I don't have any play in this game. I think Seattle's offense is fraudulent for what we've uh, seen against some very, very bad defenses. Um, but I guess I'm saying fraudulent as opposed to a good offense, as opposed to fraudulent for an average offense, which maybe they can be. Yeah. Uh, Steven, I think the one last, I think the one last point here in all this is like as bad as Seattle's, as bad as Seattle's defense has been, the question does have to, you do have to ask yourself before you want to come in and, and back the saints is, is this offense good enough to take advantage of how bad this defense is? Because Andy Dalton doesn't push the ball down the field. So he's not going to be able to throw deep balls and make explosive plays. Alvin Kamara might maybe plays, but if he does, he's obviously going to be not a hundred percent. There's going to be no Michael Thomas. So it, it just, it does make you wonder that even with as bad as Seattle has been on the defensive side of the ball, is New Orleans offense even good enough to exploit that? For sure. This is a, a situation where it's ripe for us to sit and observe the early early mm -hmm. play of these two teams, maybe get a plus seven, plus seven and a half on Seattle live if we're confident that they're able to move the ball against this defense. Uh, but there's no reason. There's no nothing saying we have to back them before the game starts with today's technology. Mm -hmm. And we have every opportunity to watch and observe and see how the early game is playing out here. If uh, if New Orleans gets an early score, but Seattle is still moving the ball fairly well, we might very well get uh, seven or more on the, on the live line here. Miami Dolphins at the New York Jets. As we sit right now, this is a flat three out there. Uh, a little bit, of, a little expensive if you want the three on the Dolphins. 45 and a half to 46 is your total. This was a big bet for me this week. It is one of the bigger bets I've made here in 2022 on the Dolphins at three. Um, this was looking five and a half or six when it was to a. We come out, uh, and when it looked like it was Tua and Flacco, it comes out that it's going to be Bridgewater and Wilson, and this thing plummets three points all the way down to Dolphins at three. I think too much is being made of this move between Tua and Teddy Bridgewater. Is it a downgrade? It is. Is it a three-point downgrade collectively between Tua and, I'm using air quotes here if you're not watching, if you're only listening to us, the upgrade to Zach Wilson from Joe Flacco. The answer to me is absolutely not massive, massive, massive over adjustment here. Zach Wilson looked horrible through three quarters. And yes, he got it together in the fourth quarter and they ended up winning the game. He looked terrible through three quarters. We don't have a ton of sample size on Zach Wilson, but the majority of the sample size we do has been him being terrible, right? And so 
I think this is a a big, big overcorrection here from the move off of Tua. It is still Teddy Bridgewater who's able to get the ball to two of the best playmakers in space and let them do their thing against a defense that is bad, just like we thought that they were going to be bad, um, especially against the pass. For me, this was just a slam dunk play on the Dolphins this week. I absolutely love it and would still play it even at the expense of three. I would still I would still make the case for this Dolphins team over and over and over again. Damn straight, Matt. Damn straight. Read my mind completely. Also, my favorite bet this week, complete overreaction to bump this all the way down to three to go from Tua to Teddy Bridgewater. How quickly we forget what Teddy Bridgewater was last year with the Denver Broncos. Top 10 in EPA and CPOE blend. In fact, only Burrow, Rodgers, and Kyler had a better completion percentage over expectation among quarterbacks with at least 500 attempts last year. And before, that was better than Russell Wilson, who Denver has now paid $48 million a year and two first-round picks to replace Bridgewater with, but that's a discussion for another day. This... This move from Tua to Bridgewater, I don't think is a downgrade whatsoever. I mean, this offense we have all basically concluded is a product of Mike McDaniel and his impressive scheme and having two elite speed wide receivers on the outside with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddle to work with. So um, this is this is not a situation where I see a three point downgrade because of the quarterback. And I'm going to continue to bet against Zach Wilson until he shows me he can do something. If you missed it last week, we reminded you that he was 44th among quarterbacks in completion percentage over expectation. He was right in that tier with Mike Glennon, as Adam mentioned last week. So until he shows it to me, I will happily continue to bet against him. Uh, Adam, the Jets don't blitz. So, you know, look, they're going to try to get pressure with their front four against Teddy Bridgewater. I think Teddy's a little bit underrated when it comes into he's he's not too. I do think it is a at least a little bit of a downgrade, certainly from a throw in the deep ball perspective. But I think what we've seen so far in this Miami offense and it makes perfect sense is, yeah, you have Tyreek Hill who does run the four three and you can throw it down the field if you want to. But you can also throw a bubble screen to him and let the ball get into his hands and have Tyree kill do Tyree kill things. And he's one of the best guys after the catch there is in the NFL, him and Debo Samuel probably right there together. And this has created a really, really good offense for Miami. And like, so you're basically just asking Bridgewater to get it into these playmakers hands somewhere around the line of scrimmage, let them do their thing against one of the worst defenses in the NFL. So I don't know. I just, I, it was, it was shocking to me to get this number. What, what am I missing? Well, I think we have to decide what our evaluation of Miami is, right? Because if we're going to say that there's not a big downgrade from Tua to Teddy Bridgewater, then we need to ask what was our upgrade of Miami after the early part of this season, right? Is it all McDaniel? Is it all the weapons? Uh, We're going to find out. Yes. Okay. I mean, if that's if that's mm-hmm. in my if, opinion, you know, if yes. that's if that's the way we're going with it, then that's fine. For me, I, I can't quite get there. Um, we we saw a lot of Teddy Bridgewater in the Denver offense, and it was bland. It was you know, and that's not just a matter of of scheme. I think is think it's a matter of skill set. So now the way you guys are looking at this game, laying the three with Miami, completely understood. The reason I'm not uh, Tyree Kill. Limited in practice. Jalen Waddle, limited in practice. Xavier Howard, limited in practice. Uh, I think right now there's a little too much question for me in terms of what Miami is going to have available to lay the three, but it's only because there's something I like better, and it's the under. Uh, the under at 46 to me is the way to play in this game, and there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, uh, you mentioned Zach Wilson. And Zach Wilson has been terrible. Uh, I think some people could be fooled by what we saw last week. But if you look at pro football focus measure of how quarterbacks perform under pressure, if you go back to last year and the sample size we had from Zach Wilson, when under pressure, Zach Wilson had a completion percentage of 29%. And if there's one thing Miami is going to do, it is blitz and put him under pressure. So I don't think the Jets are going to be successful at moving the football in this game. On the other side of this, I think this is a bit of a calculated play for Miami. So you have a bad opponent this week in the Jets. And then you look ahead to next week and you see the Minnesota Vikings. And that's the only challenging game they have 
in the next five, right? They're going to see the Steelers and the Lions and Texans. Like they, they have a pretty soft schedule here through the middle of the year. I don't think Mike McDaniel is going to push any of his weapons in this game any farther than he has to because they just don't need them right now. So I think you could see Miami get up by 14, 17 points at some point, pull some of those guys, put them on limited snaps, run the ball a little bit more. Maybe it opens a door for the Jets to to get back involved late in the game if they decide to start slinging it up to Garrett Wilson and you know maybe they find a way back in. That being said, I think you guys are on the right side if there's going to be a side uh, with uh, Miami at three. I prefer the under at 46. Uh, one thing I will say, it does look like Raheem Mostert has started to kind of separate himself a little bit as Definitely. the lead back there for Miami. His rush attempts is only listed at 14 and a half right now in this game. If we do believe that Miami has success and we do believe that there will be some salting away at the clock later on. Uh, that is a correlated play, obviously, in Mostert getting over the 14 and a half touches. So just something to think about there as well. But um, yeah, for me. Adam, you, you said it. I mean, like, it's just we can't we can't overrate what we saw last week out of Zach Wilson against the Steelers, where I think certainly us, you know, of our age our you know, we look at the Steelers. We've always just thought of the Steelers as having at least a pretty top tier defense. Right. This is a middle of the road defense right now. Like so him getting this done, it was done against a middle of the road defense. They're not bad. They're just middle of the road. So, I mean, like him getting something done against a middle of the road defense. Defense is nothing for us to jump up and down about. Again, there's just not a lot of talent on this Jets team as it is anyway. So really love the Dolphins this week. One of my favorite plays of the season. All right, let's head over to Atlanta Falcons and the Tampa Bay Bucks. This thing rocketed yesterday, guys. This was sitting eight. It is now sitting 10 at several shops. Nine and a half at the ones that aren't at double digits. 46, 46 and a half is your total Adam. We take a look at this. Look, it's probably the healthiest version of the bucks. We are going to get since, uh, you know, the first quarter of week one, we know the Falcons, Kyle Pitts has been dealing with some stuff with all them. We know that the Falcons defense is bad. And this, uh, this, this bucks defense, despite the fact that they did kind of get beat up a little bit, is still going to be one of the top 10 units when it's all said and done in the NFL. So, I got the eight. I love the Bucks in teasers. I have the Bucks in several teasers this week. The move all the way to double digits gets me a little bit kind of a little scared here as to all this. What do you think of the 10 now that is the Bucks? I favorite? think that's a play on Atlanta. Uh, if you're out of 10 and I, mm-hmm. I think we need to mm-hmm. respect this Atlanta offense a bit. Uh, quotes coming out of the Bucks. This week, if you were listening to some of what their uh, their co-defensive coordinator is saying, talking about it being a nightmare to scheme for what the Atlanta Falcons are doing in terms of formation. Uh, I'm not taking that to say, oh, no, they're not going to be able to defend the Falcons. But I do think what it says is that we're not getting a mirage when it comes to the Atlanta Falcons offense. Now, I'm not naive to the fact that Cordero Patterson is out of this game and he makes a lot of what they do go. That being said, they still managed to run the football very effectively last week with two backup running backs. So Marcus Mariota was terrible last week and they beat Cleveland. So ultimately I look at this offense and say, I think they're still live at, especially with double digits in their pocket against the Tampa offense that yes, we started to see them last week, finally be able to move the ball a little bit, but why did we see them move the ball a little bit? Because Todd Bowles had the run taken away from him. Todd Bowles is now being given the run back because he's not going to be chasing 14-3 early in the game. So Todd Bowles wants to run the football. We saw that through the first three weeks with Tampa. The reason they scored points last week wasn't because of the health. The reason they scored points was because they finally let Tom Brady throw the ball at the kind of rate that Tom Brady needs to throw the ball for this offense to get something done. So all that said, at 10, Atlanta is a play. Steven, it's a, it's, it's one of those, you know, I'm not a spot guy, but you know, listen, there's a lot of people who are going to say there's a get right spot for the bucks. And I, I, I understand, you know, look, coming back home, you're as healthy as you've been in a while. Um, I understand all that. 
I just don't know if I can get there at 10. I mean, like I, I think this now becomes more of a pass to me. I don't know if it's a Falcons play for me, but it certainly becomes more of a pass for me once we get to that double digits here. Because again, while they are as healthy as they've been since the first quarter of week one, we hadn't really seen this team, right? I mean, like we hadn't really seen them. So I don't, you know, it's we're just assuming they're going to to click. We just assume it's going to be perfectly smooth because it's a Tom Brady offense, but we have no sample size of that. So I think this might be a an evaluation week for me on this Bucks team. Adam, do you hear Matt flexing his CLV right in our face? Yeah, I got these guys on the teaser leg earlier this week. You know, just like the Vegas weather, <laughs> yeah. hot during the day and cool at night. Mr. Do you know Matt how Brown. it is? I mean, like, you, like hey, uh, he's not a Browns fan, but he does like to go to Cleveland. <laughs> hey, guys, 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 let me tell you about this mansion I have out here built off of CLV. Yeah, let me tell you. No, it does. Yeah, it means absolutely nothing. <laughs> No, I think I think it's interesting. I mean, I was I was crossing this game off and moving on. And then Adam's opinion has me, um, you know, right back to my pension to betting the board. here. So I am tempted, <laughs> sir. You have you made you made a great point. You made a great point. I think the the, the extra context I just want to add here is the summer opener on this one with what we thought of these two teams coming into the season was Bucks minus ten and a half. So when we thought the Bucks were fully healthy, they should be ten and a half. But that was also our prior opinion of Atlanta being a, a bottom three or four team in the NFL. So if you believe that the Falcons should be upgraded at this point, then there's logic would tell you there's maybe a bit of value in this number at 10. So uh, I think that's interesting. They were a 10 point dog at the Rams when we all thought the Rams were in that second tier of NFL teams. Now, I think we all agree they're probably not at this point, but um, I think we would agree that a healthy Tampa Bay is in that kind of second tier of teams behind the Chiefs and the Bills. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. I think I think Adam makes a great point. If you're upgrading Atlanta, then 10, 10 is an interesting number at this point. I uh, yeah, I, I want to see what the Bucks look like. I think that also with the way that the NFC is shaping out, there might be some value on this Bucks squad here in the next week or so, because I don't think there's a dominant team outside of the Eagles. And so they might kind of get back into the picture here. And there's probably, there's some pretty decent prices out there right now. So definitely keeping an eye on them evaluation week for me, Tennessee Titans, Washington commanders. I love the fact that y'all are on different sides of this game. I, this was the very first game that I scratched off this week, where I literally <laughs> was like, I have no opinion. Don't want to play this no matter what. Steven, I'll start with you because you're just playing a straight side here and you're on the Titans. I am. I think less than a field goal here. I, I debated this. I'm, I'm on the opposite side of our, our lead writer, um, Eli Hershkovich and our senior writer, Mona Wara, they both like Washington, but they got them at three earlier in the week. Again, another reason to listen to the Beat the Closing Line podcast. Sometimes it is absolutely very advantageous to, to bet the NFL earlier in the week. But as we stand here, I'm basically, I basically need to bet Washington to win this game. And I, I don't have much faith in Washington. Like They are among the three or four mm -hmm. worst teams in the NFL to me. And the Tennessee defensive line, number one in run stop win rate versus the number 30 run block win rate offensive line for Washington, which means Carson Wentz will likely have to throw the ball in this game. And he is bottom eight in completion percentage over expectation. He is as bad as we all expected him to be moving to yet another team. Now Dotson is out for them, so they're down to just really two receivers in Curtis Samuel and Terry McLaurin. And Washington is 31st in pass block win rate and now has to deal with a monster in Jeffrey Simmons who wrecked the game against the Colts last week. And Washington doesn't have a top 32 graded guard on the offensive line. They're both below average. So this is a t I think you're putting Carson Wentz into a situation where he has historically made a lot of mistakes. And now on the flip side with Tennessee, I think you've heard a lot of talk this week about Tennessee beating the Colts last week, but not doing it impressively based on a final yards per play of 4.7. Now, traditionally, I would agree with that, but I think context matters here. They led by 14 at the half where they put up 6.7 yards per play in that first half. They were dominant. They were awesome. And I, I don't, maybe this is a, a bad excuse and you guys can tell me if you think it is, but they kind of just 
put it into neutral and and punted every possession in the second half at 1.4 yards per play with a big lead and just kind of held on to that lead. So I kind of give him a pass for that based on how impressive they were in the first half. And Ryan Tannehill, eighth in success rate, 11th in completion percentage over expectation, now gets to face a Washington defense that's 27th in dropback EPA, 17th in dropback success rate, as they do work in my cul-de-sac here. But they're, the Washington bandwagon is leaving town, guys. Like, I am all over the Titans here. So, Adam, I, I, talked, I joked a little bit earlier in the pod about I wish I could play an over two-and-a-half quarterbacks in the Bills game. I wish I could play an over two-and-a-half quarterbacks in this game because I think there's a non-zero chance that that – Carson Wentz gets benched in this game. Like the fan base has started to scream for either Taylor Heineke or Sam Howell. And if he looks bad in this first half, it would not surprise me if he found himself on the sideline. I disagree with Eli and Mo. I disagree with you on this to back Washington. I can't back this team in any way, shape or form when you consider it's collectively a terrible offense with a terrible defense. So what did you what did you get to when you were wanting to to come in and back the the Washington Commanders this week? Let's be clear, back the Washington Commanders in a teaser. Uh I'm definitely not in a spot where I'm just taking two and a half points and uh, running to the bank with the Washington Commanders. No. And I actually texted you about this game on Sunday night and your response was very clear. I cannot do it. Uh, and here I am doing it uh, when it comes to Washington. And here's why. Uh, to me, what I'm doing here, this is a spot where I am selling Tennessee at its highest point and buying Washington at its lowest point with eight and a half in my pocket, which is the only way that I would do this. Look, we're too high on Tennessee. I was low on Tennessee to start the year. I'm still low on Tennessee because what what exactly have the Titans given us this year? They lost at home to what we all agree is probably not a good Giants team. They got absolutely wrecked by Buffalo. They barely survived a Raiders comeback against a bad Raiders team that was a two-point conversion away from sending it to overtime. And I think after this week, we all agree Indianapolis is terrible right now. So I don't know what we'll see that suggests that we should be excited about this Tennessee team. Now, I understand everything that we're talking about with the Washington Commanders. I will give them this much of a pass and only this much of a pass when it comes to talking about Carson Wentz and this offense. Over the last couple of weeks, they have played a couple of defenses that we think are pretty good in the Eagles and the Cowboys. So, yes, they've put up a grand total of 18 points in those two games. They also allowed... About 24 and a half a game. So it's not the worst when it comes to the Washington commanders. I'm not here to tell you Washington's good. I'm not here to tell you Tennessee's good either, though. And so that's why I'll take the eight and a half. Yeah, no. And and I was more just trying to set you up to to do it. Listen, it is a it is a home dog getting up to eight and a half points in a low total game. That is your typical uh, everything you're looking for in a teaser leg. It's a 42 and a half to 43 total that you're getting up to eight and a half. I was more just trying to set you up there to be able to explain two the, very the different position. arguments, right? Like both can be good. Absolutely. Yeah. Both are good. It's, it's perfect teaser range. I don't disagree with Adam whatsoever there. It's a totally different argument. Houston Texans at the Jacksonville Jags. This one is the Jags seven across the board right now. 43 and a half is your total Adam. This is spoiler alert. This is my survivor play of the week. I don't think there's a better chance to play the Jags. They're not going to be touchdown favorites. Most likely again, the rest of the season. So give me the Jags at home against the Texans who have been absolutely putrid all year long. We thought that maybe there was some hope for Davis mills entering this season. Davis mills has been atrocious. This is just, and look, he doesn't have a ton of talent around him as it is anyway. So maybe it's all going to plan for the Texans anyway. But uh, this is a really, really good, uh, really, really good teaser leg, in my opinion, as well. Can't see the Jags in this defense losing this game to the Texans outright. So uh, really like them in a survivor standpoint, really like them from a teaser leg standpoint. Arm twisted. I'd still lay it with the Jags if I had to play the game just on the side, straight up. That's kind of how I view this one pretty easily. Given, you know, look, given the Jags a pass for last week, I think the Eagles are the best team in the NFL. I have them power rated number one. I cannot 
go and, and just instantly bash teams whenever they get beaten by teams that I consider to be vastly superior. So uh, it is what it is for me in that game. And here's a new opponent and maybe the best opponent to be coming to town after you do take a beat down like they did last week. Fair when you talk about not uh, downgrading Jacksonville, but let's look at the rest of Jacksonville's games. They lost to the commanders. They beat an Indianapolis team that, again, we just talked about how much we have to downgrade Indianapolis. And I'll give them credit for what they did against the Chargers and putting up the points that they did. But of course, that was the game where Justin Herbert got hurt. And I think you had a shell shock Chargers team playing that game. So I'm not telling you that I think the Jags are bad. I'm just saying I'm, I'm pumping the brakes a little bit on what we've seen out of Jacksonville thus far. I look, I make this game Jacksonville five. But the idea of me coming in on Houston on the road, taking <laughs> points, I cannot get there. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that. that, that that's the th that's the thing, right? It's like it's like, do you can you can you have a Texans ticket in your account with Davis Mills at quarterback at this point? I mean, Stephen, I, I actually was a little higher on Davis Mills. I, like, I didn't think he was good by any stretch. I just thought that he would be, you know. A, the 20th best quarterback in the league or something, you know, something like that. But he hadn't even been that so far. This offense has been just, just putrid to go along again with the defense where teams are really just kind of getting whatever they want on this team. The only thing that they really have going for them, they've been at least decent kind of league average from a pressure rate standpoint. So that at least the quarterbacks can't sit back there and have all day long to throw against them. But uh, you can run against this team very, very well. And by the way, what do the Jags have? A pretty potent run offense as well. And so I, uh, I I like the Jags a ton. And again, specifically from a teaser leg standpoint and a survivor standpoint. Yeah, slam dunk teaser leg for me as well here. Uh, Davis Mills, to your point, has not been elevated by the weapons he has around him. He's played 16 games now, eight at home, eight on the road. At home, 69% completion percentage, 16 touchdowns, three picks, 7.6 yards per attempt. 106 passer rating on the road, 61%, five touchdowns, 11 picks, 5.5 yards per attempt and a 64 passer rating. I don't know if they got to like get his home mattress in the hotel rooms or something, but he has not been a good quarterback on the road for what has now been basically a full season. And there is no reason to have confidence that he can cover a spread against a what I think is a really good defense here. This is a, a trenches mismatch as well. Mm -hmm. Houston, number 30 DVOA offense against the number six DVOA defense for Jacksonville. Jacksonville top five in pass rush win rate, top five in pass block win rate, but 28th in pressure allowed for Houston. So that's another indication of a quarterback that's holding the ball on for far too long. Um, yeah, just a, just a slam dunk teaser leg here for me. San Francisco 49ers on the road at the Carolina Panthers, six and a half. And this has been stuck at six and a half pretty much all week long in favor of the 49ers, a total of 39 and a half. You can find a 38 and a half <laughs> out in the market right now in this thing. Steven, look, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I think it's a great teaser leg here. Do I want to be laying? Do I need the, do I want the 49ers to have to win by a touchdown on the road, this is probably more of a contest play for me where I would probably play the 49ers in a contest. I think the Panthers are bottom three team in the NFL. They want the coach gone. They want the quarterback gone. I actually think if they lose this game by getting thumped, that this might actually be rules last game. I think they could probably get rid of him after this one as well. It's definitely 49ers are pass for me. I just, you know, with the state of the 49ers offense, I don't really know if I want to lay points on the road for them to win by an entire touchdown. But, uh, you know, look, teaser leg for sure. You're just teasing them down to win. They're going to win. They're not going to lose this game. The Panthers defense is too good to lose this game to this Panthers offense that cannot do anything whatsoever. Not your traditional teaser leg, but I agree with yeah. you. I teased them down as well and paired them with the Packers. Mm -hmm. The 49ers defense is allowing 3.8 yards per play. That's number one in the NFL. For context, the 1985 Bears allowed 4.4 yards per play. And the 2000 Ravens allowed 4.3 yards per play. The Niners defense has been otherworldly to start the year. And again, it's because of that modern day NFL cheat code of being able to pressure the quarterback without blitzing. They are 13th in pass rush win rate with a top 10 pressure rate and number two in the NFL in sacks, despite having the number 31 ranked blitz rate. 
It's incredible what they're doing. And a fun little narrative here. I don't know how close you guys follow college football, but like Nick Bosa hates Baker Mayfield's guts going back to when <laughs> Baker Mayfield planted the flag at the 50 yard line at Ohio state. And they had some words the last time they, these two players played against each other. So, and Nick Bosa has six sacks and is looking like a pretty strong defensive player of the year candidate and is probably licking his chops to play Baker Mayfield, a quarterback who was 37th in the league last year in EPA per attempt when pressured and this year dead last in EPA success rate and completion percentage over expectation. If you think Carolina is going to move this ball in this defense, God bless you. Cause I don't see it. Adam, we take a look here. I mean, the handicap is fairly simple, right? I mean, you have the the best defense in the NFL right now in San Francisco going up against a bottom three offense. The only way that Carolina can move the ball at all is running it with Christian McCaffrey, but you can't run on this defense either. So, I mean, where the points are going to come from, I totally get the total being under 40. I completely understand all that. I mean, it's it's... San Francisco is going to win. The question is just how much are they going to win by? Are you willing to take the six and a half with Carolina is basically what it comes down to. No, I, I'm not. I see why you guys are in on the teaser. I think the total, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, is too low. Uh, 38 okay. and a half is 38 and a half is a low total. That's That's Iowa for football. A game. That's Iowa I mean, Big guys, Ten football, baby. <laughs> This is a game. It, it's not a weather game. Like I understand how bad we're talking about the Carolina team being overall, but would it shock you to see San Francisco put up 27 or 30 uh, in this game? No, uh, it wouldn't shock me. Hmm. And then at that point, you're not asking a whole lot out of Carolina. So I, it's not a huge play for me. It's probably about a half play hmm. for me on the over here. But, uh, you know, I think the number is too low. Dallas Cowboys on the road at the Los Angeles Rams right now. Five, five and a half in favor of the Rams. 43 is your total. Adam, we're going to get Cooper Rush at least for one more week here for the Cowboys. The thought for me was if this thing got to six, I'd probably take the Cowboys. Then CeeDee Lamb popped up on the injury report. They were saying it's more preventative than anything else, but that has me a little bit squeamish to back the Cowboys in this situation. I'm not laying anything with the Rams. I, I know people are kind of laying, uh, talking about this as being a buy low spot for this Rams squad, but uh, there's a reason that it's low right now for this Rams team, and I ain't buying it. Uh, I, it's not happening. Like when you have to throw 19 times to one receiver because you don't trust anybody else out there other than your tight end who's running three yard outs and shit like that, like just no way for me to uh, to back this Rams team. It, it is just, uh, I, I can't. How do you really I'm, feel? Yeah, I mean, it's call just, the censors. It, yeah, it's it's it's, it's un, unbelievable here. Uh, so, I mean, I honestly think if this gets to a six, I'll probably have a small play on, on the Cowboys, and it, and it might get to six. I think a lot of people are looking at this as a as a buy low spot for this Ram squad, but boy, I don't know what you're buying at this low. What's to buy? There's yeah. nothing to buy. And, and look, I'll tell you, as someone who I have one teaser for this week that's already dead mm. because I tied it to Rams seven and a half uh, on Monday night. <laughs> yeah. um, what I saw that I hadn't really planned on was this Rams offensive line getting wrecked. And I realized mm. they lost their center during the game, but the rookie they brought in looked like any one of the three of us could have given you the Wolf. same performance in that contest. And now Mike Parsons is coming to town mm -hmm. and I, my evaluation rarely gets down to, Oh, it's about this one matchup. How exactly are the Rams going to keep Matthew Stafford upright yeah. in this game. I don't know how they're going to be able to do it. So yeah, the CD lamp thing is worrying to me, but as long as he's on the field, I feel pretty good about you want Cowboys five and a half. Fine. You want Cowboys six. Fine. Uh, Cooper rush. If he goes has proven to at least be competent. He has not been good, but he has been competent and he hasn't been making mistakes and putting them into bad situations. The Cowboys are playing with house money right now. They don't need to rush Dak Prescott back. So in this game, for me, I don't know how the Rams keep Matthew Stafford from being on his back. And mind you, when Matthew Stafford has been worried about being on his back, where has he thrown the ball to the other team? Well, I, and, and, and Steven, this is not your Rams defense of old either, right? Like this defense is beatable. This defense is get outable. And then this is not your Matt Stafford of old either. Like, you know, we're talking about is Russell Wilson washed? Is Matt Ryan washed? 
I, I'm not I'm not willing to say that that Matt Matt Stafford's washed. I'm willing to say that we should keep an eye on Matt Stafford. He has made some very terrible decisions, some very bad throws, some very, very bad decisions so far. And so I, I, I again, like kind of like Adam said, I don't know what you're buying with this team. I really pray this gets to six. I'm going to come in on Dallas if that's the case. And um, I just, I think this Rams team might be one of those teams where we look at and say, they're fine. They're not good. Like I think they're fine. They'll beat the teams. They're you know they'll beat up on bad teams. But any team with a pulse is going to be a real struggle for them. Yeah. First of all, I need CD Lamb to play. That's that's a prerequisite. Yep. He yeah. was, he was a midweek downgrade with a groin injury. So we need to watch that on Friday and see what the situation is. If he's not playing, I I can't get there with the Cowboys. Um, but but I completely agree with you guys because I don't think enough has been put on the protection of the Rams in the market. I think everybody's just assuming this is a get right spot against the backup quarterback. The two teams that the Rams played with a pass rush, Buffalo and San Francisco, Matthew Stafford was sacked seven times in both of those games. And to your point with the offensive linemen for the Rams, two interior offensive linemen, back-to-back DMPs for them. So I'm watching that injury report as well. So the Bills and the 49ers, fifth and 13th in pass rush win rate, The Cowboys are number one. They're the best in the league. And it's not Mm -hmm. just Micah Parsons. Like he's getting attention. He's getting help in the blocking game. That's freeing up Demarcus Lawrence and all these other guys to get home on the quarterback and pressure and get sacks and cause game wrecking plays. So I don't think enough value has been given to that. You can make up all the the excuses you want about the Cowboys offense isn't going to be able to move the ball as effectively against the Rams as they have against a couple of easy opponents easy opponents the past couple of weeks but you better at least note that Matthew Stafford's playing perhaps the best pass rush in the NFL this week and you still need him to move the ball as well if you want him to cover a big number like this and I am not confident that he can so if we get a clean bill of health on CD Lamb then I'm in if we get to six here the Rams have played the Rams have two guys, two guys that have played good all season: Cooper Cup and Aaron Donald. That's it. Yep. All these other guys have been inconsistent. Matt, to, to your point with Aaron Donald, like he's played well, but nobody else around him in the front seven has. They're dead last in pressure yeah. rate, which has hung out the secondary. Which to is dry. why they're triple teaming him every time, like because yeah. they don't have to worry about these other guys. Like so, you watch, and there's at any given time, there's two or three guys blocking Aaron Donald because they're not worried about any of the other guys. Yeah, and because all. they can't get pressure, their their pass defense metrics have been bad despite the talent they have. They're 25th and 22nd in drop back EPA and success rate. If they don't get pressure, everything else falls apart on this defense i agree this is a cowboys are pass. give us a six guys give us a six out there philadelphia eagles at the arizona cardinals we are sitting five five and a half right now in favor of the eagles 48 and a half to 49 i played the eagles guys this is a prove it game to me i know the trendy pick is the cardinals this week and i get it it's the you know if you believe in spots it's the it's the quintessential letdown spot it is the eagles going on the road against a team that they think is bad and they no show well if that's the case for me i think there's only two ways to play it either the eagles show up and just prove that they're one of the best teams in the nfl and they stomp the cardinals like they probably should or you play the cardinals on the money line because it's a no show by the eagles and the cardinals just win the game outright i don't see any reason to take 5 points in this game in the Cardinals, it's not going to be close. It's going to be one way or the other. The Eagles are going to beat an inferior team like they should, or the Cardinals are just going to win the game outright. I mean, Adam, when I look at this one, I see an Eagles team that there is there is pretty much no holes in this offense, uh, no holes in this team, top to bottom on the offense or defensive side of the ball. If you want to nitpick something, Jalen Hurts has not been as great against the Blitz. We know what the Cardinals do. They blitz and blitz and blitz and blitz and blitz. So that's why I say you either play the Cardinals money line or you just assume that Jalen Hurts gets it right and the Eagles just do what they're supposed to do because the the blitz is either going to affect them so much that they can't get anything going on the offensive side of the ball or they will have a game plan for the blitz and the Eagles are just going to, to stomp the Cardinals like they probably should. I will tap the brakes on the Eagles because of this. Detroit, Minnesota, Washington, Jacksonville. They haven't necessarily played the toughest of competition, but here's why I have to say only tap the brakes because they're not going to play anybody all year long. 
right? You, like this schedule yeah. is horrible. <laughs> so you're, you're never going to get the game with the Eagles this year that says, oh, well, here comes the big showdown. We're going to find out if the Eagles are. No, like the Eagles are going to continue to play teams that they're going to be favored against for the bulk of this year. So I can't get too far ahead of myself in saying, oh, well, let's wait until they play somebody. No, and, and somebody is certainly not Arizona. Um, I think you could probably throw out that game last week with how bad Carolina ultimately is uh, for Arizona. By the way, what did we do wrong to get this team in a three game afternoon window two weeks in a row? Goodness, that is horrible to have to watch Arizona again. So I'm with you, Matt. I I like the way you're looking at this game. If I were to get involved, it would be Philly or nothing. I'm going to pass on it. Steven, if we look at this, I mean, I I don't know how you feel like I I mean, I backed. I backed Philly at five. And again, it's like, to me, it was, I tried to sell it off. To, I tried to sell it up to five and a half. I couldn't find the, no in Nevada. I couldn't find a book that would let me, let me do it. So I just had to take the five. Um, but it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a deal for me that Arizona, maybe when they get Deandre Hopkins back, maybe we start to look at them at least a little bit differently because they do have at least a, a one true playmaker out on the field for them on the offensive side. But as of right now, that's not them. It's a bottom 10 offense. It is a bottom five, six defense, something like that. So again, it's, they're going to blitz. Does the blitz get home is basically the question. How impressive were the Eagles last week getting down 14, nothing in the rain and still winning by two scores. Like this is a, a physical football team that is imposing their will on, on defenses. And we thought Jacksonville has an above average defense. I thought that was extremely impressive last week. And on the flip side here, Last year, the average yards per play in the NFL was 5.5. The Cardinals haven't reached that in a game yet. Like, if you're worried about the Eagles not showing up here, the Cardinals haven't shown up on time for kickoff the entire season to start the year. So Mm -hmm. I don't really care what they did against the Raiders and the Panthers, whatever. In games against the Rams and the Chiefs, which is much closer to the tier that we all believe the Eagles are in at this point, they got annihilated in those two games against the Rams and the Chiefs. And... Arizona was outgained by 2.9 yards per play against those two opponents. Guys, that is massive to be outgained by 2.9 yards per play. That's how you lose by two scores at home, right there, with a spread of only five and a half here. And the Eagles will run it down your throat with this offensive line. They are number two in run block win rate. The Cardinals are number 27 in run stop win rate. If they want to pass it, the Cardinals are number 26 and number 31 in drop back EPA and success rate. So pick your poison here. I don't know how the Cardinals defense stops this offense unless they just send the house on zero blitzes and Jalen Hurts can't handle it. And on the flip side with Kyler, I mean, outside, he's taken such a big step back through the first month of the season from what we've seen when he was healthy in previous seasons. Outside the top 20 in EPA success rate and completion percentage over expectation, And the Philly defense is top three against the pass in two of those advanced statistics. They have three, not two, three top five corners in terms of PFF grade. And they are number one in pressure rate, despite being number 20 in blitz rate. Everything you could possibly want in a football team right now is the Philadelphia Eagles. And a lot of what you don't want in a football team is the Arizona Cardinals. Cincinnati Bengals and the Baltimore Ravens will have a more in-depth uh, video of this, of course, on the channel later on uh, Sunday morning. But real quick, as we sit right now, Ravens, three, three and a half point home favorites in this one over Cincinnati, a total of 47 and a half to 48. Uh, first bet I made all week, Bengals plus three and a half. I think Bengals money line is perfectly fine here. Uh, I understand Lamar Jackson playing an MVP level. I agree. That said, didn't look all that great the last couple of weeks. I think the Cincinnati team over time is going to just continue to get better and better and better. And what certainly heals all wounds is this Ravens defense right now. And I think Cincinnati, again, remember Joe Burrow had the appendectomy, didn't get to play all preseason, didn't get rapport with the receivers. It's one of those deals where Adam, if we take a look at this, I think if we're going to, if we're really going to kind of like nitpick, you know, Cincinnati's early season performances, you just got to remember what the situation is. I think they only get better as the season goes along, and I think that uh, this could be a big day for this offense against this defense. I'm going to sound like I'm telling you the opposite of what I'm telling you at the beginning here, so uh, mm-hmm. bear with it. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens this year are 2-2. Two and two. They've trailed for 14 seconds total. 
They've trailed mm-hmm. for 14 seconds this year. That being said, the reason they're in the position to have trailed for 14 seconds is they've blown two three score leads on this season. And that is absolutely concerning. This is hard for me. Baltimore is a team I am so much higher on than the rest of the market. And yet, even given that, my numbers come out to Baltimore two and a half. So you know, what it, normally I'm not worried about one point, but when that one point is the two and a half to three and a half, then yeah, I, I, I'm a hard lean on Cincinnati uh, for this game. I'll probably be in by the end of the week. Steven, tell us why we're right about Cincinnati. <laughs> I bet it too. I bet three and a half. And mm-hmm. if you want to hear why uh, we're wrong, maybe about Cincinnati, our coworkers, I, I, at least Eli, I'm, I'm not sure about Mo, but he's he's on Baltimore here. He's got Baltimore Ravens futures. Uh, you can go read his arguments on the website and his, and his bets mm-hmm. column and also beat the closing line. But yeah, I, I the most interesting thing I saw this week in NFL media was from NFL Live and Dan Orlovsky and the NFL Live crew breaking down what's going on with the 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 Bengals running fewer and fewer snaps out of shotgun and Mina Kimes noting the, the increased number of under center snaps. The Ravens have been, I'm sorry, the, the Bengals have been trotting out there from week to week as we go along here. One of the most in-depth, well-researched pieces of content I've seen in the NFL this year. Go find it. It's another reason why I am very optimistic about the Bengals improving despite a really slow start against mm-hmm. a weak schedule. Guys, everything we do, absolutely free on the lines. Go ahead, subscribe, rate, review. Let us know in the comments how you are playing this week. What is your favorite bet of the week as well? This is an awesome week. We're going to find out a lot about these teams, and we do appreciate all the support from you guys out there. For Adam, for Steven, I'm Matt. Talk to you guys next week.